So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Um, I just want to go through some housekeeping items first. Uh, my name is Rick Jewell, and I am an executive assistant with the Aurora Mental Health Center, and I will be acting as the moderator for today's webinar. This happens to be our eighth and final webinar in this series. However, I do apologize for any glitches and technical difficulties should they arise. I have muted and stopped video feed for all participants in order for all to focus on the presenter as well as to protect your individual privacy. This webinar is being recorded and will be utilized for both the Aurora Chamber of Commerce and the Aurora Mental Health Center's internal and external audiences in order to continue supporting our community during this challenging time. To further protect your individual privacy, each of you have the ability to click on the three dots on the upper right hand of your individual screens and then rename yourself, or you may even just put in dot, dot, dot if you so wish. When we get to the question and answer section during the last 10 to 20 minutes of today's webinar, please direct all questions to me, Rick Jewell, via the chat function privately and I will state the question to the presenter and all. This will, this will promote more privacy as to who is asking the question. If you so choose to keep your name visible, that is completely fine, as well as if you wish me to unmute your audio so that you can ask the question directly, please state so in your private chat message that you send to me. For those of you who are not familiar with the Zoom platform, the chat feature is found at the bottom of your Zoom screen it will open up and the chat feature box to the right automatically defaults to everyone. Feel free to change the everyone in the drop down to say Rick Jewell in order to send those chat questions to me privately. You may also send your questions throughout the presentation to me. However, they will not be asked until the Q&A time at the <clears throat> very end. At this point in time, I would like to introduce Lauren Jassel, a colleague from Aurora Mental Health Center and your presenter for today. And I'm going to bring up her PowerPoint. So share with, spare with me, spare with me. There we go. All uh, right. It's around here somewhere. <laughs> By time. Should I tell a joke? Yeah, could you? <laughs> really was just done. I, uh, so my stepdaughter, seven year old stepdaughter, has some pretty ridiculous knock knock jokes. So if she was here, I would have her uh, entertain you guys. Oh, could you vamp? <laughs> knock, 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 knock for today? Um, I think uh, maybe at the end. We'll see how. Uh, oh, okay. All right. Well, the presentation hits. Yeah. Sorry, it did get uh, closed there inadvertently. So uh, we want right. people to make right. sure that they know us. Okay, here. I told you there'd be technical difficulties. Look at that. Very nice. And We're all navigating all of this at home stuff. Um, yeah, if you want to put it there, you go. Perfect. All right. Um, and are we recording? Yes. Okay. Um, so welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining on your Friday afternoon. Hopefully you're enjoying some lunch um, while you are um, listening and um, have some great plans for the weekend. So um, this presentation is called Supporting the Emotional Well-Being of Children and Families During COVID. Um, and my name is Lauren Jassel. Um, and I will introduce a little bit more about myself on the next slide. Oops, Let's see. All right, so um, just so everyone knows my notes are kind of off to my left, so if you see me looking back and forth, but um, so a little bit about me, oh, one, uh, one more back to the welcome and introductions, thank you. Um, so a little about me, so um, again, my name is Lauren Jassel, I've been at a Warren Mental Health Center for the past year, um, and was at a different mental health center in Colorado for six years prior to that. So um, in all of my seven years out here in Colorado, I've been in community mental health. Um, I am a licensed clinical social worker and also have my infant mental health endorsement. Um, I really spent my career focused on prevention and intervention services for youth and families. And my work really takes an ecological approach. Um, I believe that um, we are part of systems, you know, our family system, our community system, um, our environment, and that um, our goal is to really help families and youth thrive in their environment. Um, my role at Aurora Mental Health is I am the clinical director over our child specialty programs. And so that includes an array of prevention programs, 
higher acuity programs, programs for youth with um, dual mental health and developmental disabilities, um, refugee programs, also have some healthcare access and um, adult refugee programs. So um, really span a lot of the youth continuum that we offer at Aurora Mental Health Center. Um, and so in starting to think about the focus of our presentation today, um, we can start with the idea that children thrive on structure, routine, expectations. Um, and as adults, it is our job to help kiddos regulate their emotions, to understand the world around them, and to model the behaviors that we want in our children. And with COVID-19, this pandemic has turned everything upside down. Um, and we're really learning each day as we go. And so, and even as we're talking about returning to normal, what really is normal? What, what has changed that is gonna impact what we consider normal? And so the focus of this presentation and our time together is to really think about how we can support kids of all ages and support families during this unprecedented time. So my uh, presentation will be about 30 to 40 minutes. And then as Rick said, um, we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end. Next slide, please. All right, so just to review um, the presentation takeaways. So we're gonna talk about, and hopefully you'll gain an understanding of children's emotional needs and ways to provide support during COVID. Ideas for creating structure and routines for both children and adults during all of this. And then also, why is this important? I think we hear a lot about try this tactic or this tip, but why? And I wanna get into like the brain development and the way that our body like physiologic physiologically responds um, to changes in our environment. So we're really gonna get into the why. And then um, ending with just a slide or two on community resources. I think there's a lot that our community has been doing um, and it's important to be aware to refresh ourselves um, around what's out there for kids and families right now. Next slide, please. Thank you, Rick. Um, all right, so to start us off, um, here is a visual that really encapsulates you know, the widespread impact on COVID um, on our mental health. And there has been such a big shift in how we operate day to day and really our normal ways of functioning. So if we think about, I think that top one really stands out to me the most. We've been switching from kind of a living and daily functioning to survival mind state. Um, I've heard a joke that, you know, when you go to the grocery store now, you're like walking around every aisle looking as if you would in like a zombie apocalypse movie, right? Like we're aware of where people are around us and um, that causes us to act and feel in different ways. Um, we have fear for loved ones. We have um, friends and family and colleagues who may be worried about getting sick. Um, job security is huge right now. You know, what's it gonna look like for our jobs moving forward? What's it gonna look like for our kids going back to school? Um, and there's definitely an increased sense of isolation um, because even though it's great to be with people on the phone and over Zoom, it's definitely not the same as giving a loved one a hug or being able to um, be face to face with someone. And so we really can see like how all of this is impacting us. Next slide, please. And so this is really the case um, for kiddos as well. Um, I, you know, I'm looking at kind of these five categories here, which I'll go over. Um, we can really look at this as a framework for understanding some of the ways that kiddos uh, may be impacted during COVID. Um, it's important to remember that every child is different and this impact may look different based on their age, a family's culture and norms, the child's cognitive abilities, so what's their understanding of the world around them, their processing abilities, and then also a history of trauma. If a kiddo has a history of trauma, they're gonna naturally be reacting differently to their environment than a child who has not experienced trauma. And in this, what I find really interesting is you may see new behaviors or the absence of old behaviors. So um, you may see a kiddo acting impulsively when they typically haven't before, or you may see a child who typically was very talkative talking much less. And so we often think about the absence of or the presence of behaviors. Certain skills that, may, that a child may have mastered may suddenly be harder for them to perform. And looking, kind of setting that up and looking at this framework can help us understand why. So the first one, sense of safety. Um, there's a lot that is included in here. So we can think about um, emotional safety, um, you know, how do I know what's happening next? What can I expect? Physical safety with something such as housing security or insecurity. Um, are we gonna be able to pay rent? Are we gonna be able to stay um, in our neighborhood? Or 
Um, you know, my parents are working all day and so I'm home by myself with my older sibling, which I'm typically not doing. So that may bring up um, a different sense of safety for a kiddo. Um, financial safety, what can I expect? Um, a child's ability to remain calm and regulated may be impacted. Um, it's pretty hard to stay um, calm and make good you know, decisions. Well, it's sometimes hard for kids to do that in general, right? Because they're so impulsive, but, um, or they can be so impulsive, but even more so to do that when there's so much unknown and uncertainty in the environment. And we'll go much uh, further into that. Um, Self-efficacy and community efficacy are impacted. So the idea that um, those around us can keep us safe and can be impactful. So as kiddos, especially young kiddos, right, where they're learning about their world, they're learning about how to um, handle their emotions and boundaries and, you know, why you shouldn't get in someone else's personal space and all these things that kids are teaching us. Kids need the adults and the environment around them to, um, to be able to handle the things that they can't, right, those skills that we want to teach them. And so that might be um, kind of uncertain right now during COVID. Connectedness, right? We're not having big family gatherings. Kids aren't at school. Um, there's a lot that, um, that kids kind of need to thrive and have that social interaction that we're not getting right now. Um, and then the sense of hope. Um, this may be impacted right now and have an impact on, on children's emotional well-being. Um, what, what is our sense that things will get better? Um, we're navigating this unknown. And, you know, as adults, we have a little bit more context for what's happening and we can understand it. And we can maybe look back to other points in our lives where we had a challenging situation and we were able to overcome it and move through it. And kids don't necessarily have that context. Um, so that might have an impact on them. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit later on about how to talk with kids about COVID. I think that's a big piece. Um, and we'll get into that more specifically um, a little bit later. All right. Thank you, Rick. Um, so um, another framework that we can use to think about all of this is the Kugler-Ross grief cycle model. This might be pretty familiar to some of you. I think it's, it's in our common vernacular to talk about um, the grief cycle. Um, but let's look at these categories. I really like this visual. I like that it's kind of a wave as opposed to a cycle because I do, um, I like the metaphor of kind of the ebb and flow of waves. And I think that that's um, very, um, it really resonates with what people are experiencing right now. Um, so there are five key phases to the grief cycle. So we can see denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. And this is kind of the general order of how they progress, but obviously everybody is different. And I think pretty often we think about, kind of in our common language, we think about grief as the loss of a loved one or the loss of a pet, the loss of, of something tangible. Um, but during COVID and during everything we're experiencing, what about grieving the loss of normalcy, of routine, of a sense of purpose, right? Like of, of just knowing how our day is gonna look um, different than, than before when we were working in an office and not with our kids and you know pets running all around us. So how might we use this model to think about what our society is experiencing right now, kind of collectively, um, and how might this be manifesting in children? We know that the way a child um, experiences maybe a sense of helplessness under that depression category, it's gonna be different than an adult. Or the way that a teenager could express feeling that way um, is going to be different than how a five-year-old might be able to express that. Um, and so like I, I alluded to, I mean, we're really experiencing this collective grief process in a way that I don't think has happened in, in recent lifetime. Um, and so, you know, we think about the loss of, you know, changes in environment and, you know, things like safety regulations and travel restrictions changing. We know that this is going to be kind of an ongoing process that we're all working through. Um, and one of the things that I find really interesting is, you know, what does it mean for different people in your, in your life, in particular you and the kiddos that you may work with or live with? What happens if you're all in different phases of this? What happens if your kiddo is in the depression phase, but you're in the anger phase or vice versa, right? How do we tap into what we need and what's going on with us and also what our child may be experiencing and, you know, and how does all that work, right? It's hard. It's also hard if we're in the acceptance phase and we have a kiddo who's really in the anger phase 
And we want them just to like get to where we are and move along, but everyone is so different. And I think this model is really helpful to look at that. Um, let's see, I'm just looking at my notes. Um, and so how might this look for kiddos, especially when they're not as in tuned with their emotions, right? Our hope is that we, we help kids when they're young learn how to express themselves so they can be really solid communicators. Um, but especially during this time, I think this is such a challenge. And so, you know, your kiddos may show you through their behavior that they're struggling with what they've heard or what they've seen or what's going on. Um, they may have problems with attention and concentration. You may see increases in irritability and defiance. Um, often, in particular with younger kiddos, depression can look like irritability and defiance. Um, and it's different than what we typically see in our media around depression being like you're, in, you're lying in bed and you don't have the energy to get out. Um, that look, can look very different in younger kiddos. Um, there could be sleep and appetite changes, overeating, undereating, um, and then just general worry about what's happening um, in, in the world. Um, and we, you may see that children and even teens um, who typically may be more independent are maybe being clingier to you, um, seeking your attention, and just wanting to be around you more than normal or more than usual. Um, it's really important to approach any of this with compassion and acceptance, both for yourself and for the child, even, even though that's so much easier said than done, right? It's really hard to, um, to do that sometimes when, when things are really hard and we're struggling to manage so much. Um, and I think a key piece is we often want to know as adults, like, why is a child doing what they're doing? What is actually causing that thing? And I think the hardest thing right now is to come and understand all of this through a lens of, we may not really know the root. We just may not. But how can, we, how can we support the child with what's happening and what we're seeing kind of in front of us? Um, it's really important to be focused on how we can help kiddos, um, positive encouragement, talking them through what's going on, and then to be patient with them. You know, be patient with them, be patient with yourself. Um, as the parent of a seven-year-old, you know, I know how challenging it is right now to balance um, working and, you know, keeping her occupied and all that at the same time. Um, all being home together all the time is not something we are used to doing. Um, you know, weekends, vacations, of course, but I'm um, typically we're at work and she's at school and, um, or at camp. And so this is a very different experience for all of us and it takes practice. Um, and it takes us just kind of figuring it out as we go. Uh, next slide, please. So um, I won't read through this entire slide or the next. The next is, is part two with the older age groups. Um, but these charts show examples of the types of behaviors um, that we might be seeing from kiddos of various ages during the time. Um, there is a link at the end of the slide deck to um, the full resource. So um, I mentioned it down below, but um, I find this chart to be very helpful and kind of normalizing in some of the things that you might be experiencing with children in your own life or children that you work with. So um, for really young ones, you might see increased temper tantrums, um, that kind of separation, anxiety, fear of being alone. You may see some regression in behavior, right? So regression, regression in toileting um, and doing things independently. Um, so on the right, just goes through some of the things that I've already talked a little bit about, um, about it, or we will talk more about, but um, doing some routine, um, and really maintain that patience for yourself and um, kiddo as you work through this. Next slide. Um, and then this goes into um, school age and adolescence. So, um, so school age kids, again, that cleanness, um, you might start to see some of the physical symptoms um, that we see when, when sometimes they're stress related. So stomach aches, headaches, um, they might have less um, attention about things or less um, attention to things they normally attend to. And you might just see a kiddo zonked out, you know, staring at their, their, um, their tablet. And I think, you know, our first thought is, oh, this kid is just kind of obsessed with their technology. But part of that too is that withdrawal, right? Just like as adults, we might binge watch a bunch of movies or play a bunch of video games when we are just, you know, we just want to turn our brain off. And so that might be something to um, be aware of that could indicate some struggles that kiddos having with adjusting to the lack of routine and friendship interaction, all of that. Um, with adolescents, um, you may see increased agitation. Um, you may see ignoring health promotion behavior, so not showering as often, 
um, not kind of staying up on their hygiene um, and, and being more isolated. Um, so just again, some, and some ideas for how to um, have conversations, set time to, to talk about these things, family routines, um, limiting media exposure, which we're gonna get into in um, the next couple slides. All right, so this is what I see as one of the biggest um, steps you can take in working through um, what's going on with, potentially with your kiddos is talk to them. Um, I think as adults, um, our goal is really to help kiddos become attuned to their feelings, um, to build awareness of their internal dialogue, and then also their external actions, right? The way that they, they take that internal dialogue, the, the stories that we all tell ourselves and act upon it. Um, and to help them regulate and cope. And so a key piece of this is having open and honest conversations with your kids. Um, I'm often, often amazed um, at how kids perceive and understand the difficult things in their lives. Um, you know, just never know what's going on inside of a kid's head. And um, I actually think it's kind of fun and interesting to hear how a kid explains what's happening in the world around them. Um, and so ask them what they know about COVID. You know, this will help you gauge their understanding um, and actually address any rumors or misinformation um, they might have. So again, uh, as an example, I'm talking to my seven-year-old. Um, the way she describes it is there are bad germs that are making people sick and that we have to stay away from them. Um, but even with that, sometimes she gets confused. She gets confused whether um, it's okay to talk to some of our family members or um, she gets confused about how long this will last. So hearing from her and then being able to answer her questions um, and even if those questions come up repeat, repeatedly, um, you know, to, to take the time to, to have that conversation. So um, you may say something like, you know, there's been a lot of talk about COVID or coronavirus. Tell me what you know about it. What have you heard about it? What questions do you have? Um, and then work to correct that, that um, any inaccurate information and focus on how you can help keep them safe. So what I've said to our kiddo is, well, that's why we wear masks when we um, go for bike rides in busy areas, or that's why when we take the dogs to the vet, we can't go inside with them. The vet comes out and brings the dog in themselves. Um, so setting that within context and helping them understand that we are actively doing things to help keep them safe. And then ask about how they're feeling about the virus, right? There's the facts, but there's also the feelings. Um, and it's important to validate whatever emotions they may be experiencing, if they're scared, if they're worried, if they're confused, um, oftentimes, you know, we really want to help our kiddos feel better, and we may inadvertently dismiss those feelings, like, oh, don't worry about it, or we don't need to talk about that, it'll get better. And we do it because we want to protect them, um, but the reality is we don't necessarily know what's going to happen, right? And we don't necessarily know if it's going to be okay. And so it's okay for things to not be okay, right? As long as we're couching it within that context of here are the things that we're doing to, to keep things safe. We don't know how long this is going to last, but here's what we're doing for right now. Um, and then for older youth, um, you know, their primary connections with their friends um, at school and their, their world is probably mainly social media right now. Um, and so make this a part of the conversation. Tell me what your friends are saying about coronavirus. Um, what, have, what have you been seeing online? What are people talking about? Um, and it's important to be aware that social media can feel like a way for people to connect, um, but really it can be quite isolating and quite harmful. We know it's not the same level of interaction um, or kind of absently, absentmindedly scrolling th through things as we would if we we're having a face-to-face -face conversation. Um, and I think especially during this time, it's really important to be mindful of more vulnerable youth populations, such as the LGBTQI population, um, kiddos with developmental delays, and then our refugee families, especially those who have you know, multilingual homes and may not have access to the same types of support as um, primarily English speaking homes. Um, and we know that there's just been a lot of loss for older youth right now. You know, they're not having proms and graduations. Um, I have a half brother who just graduated from college and um, you know, we had to do an online celebration, right? He didn't get to walk and with his cap and gown um, the way that you, know, you picture when you're graduating from college. So um, talk to them about it and acknowledge that um, you know, we're all dealing with, you know, different things right now, and it's important for us to be communicating about it, and that's a really important way of staying connected. Next slide. All right. 
Um, so let's switch gears a little bit um, and talk about the importance of creating structure at home. So um, our days are typically filled with the activities that keep us on a routine, right? We have school, sports, work. Um, in the summer, we go to the pool, the amusement park, beaches, camps. Um, and many of these activities are on hold right now. Um, and so, you know, what can we do to recreate some of the structure, but also more importantly, why? Why do we want to do that? Why is it important? And um, structure creates predictability. It creates a sense of control. We know what's happening next. We know we want to get this thing done because we're going to be going to the park at three. Um, and generally, even though nothing ever goes perfectly, it does give us a sense of what's next and a little bit of a sense of control. Um, so although many of us have been working from home for weeks now, we may still not feel like we have a solid structure, right? We're adjusting as we go. We're figuring out what's working, what's not. Um, and due to this and, you know, really everything we've discussed already related to COVID, um, we may be feeling more stressed, more worried, more anxious than usual. Um, and when we're experiencing those stress, worry, upset, um, our nervous system is working over time, right? And you may feel it with the kind of that, like your heart racing or the butterflies in your stomach. Um, our adrenaline, our cortisol levels are up. Um, and it's hard for our minds and our bodies to stay regulated, right? It's where we might find ourselves like pacing or I'm in a wheelie chair right now to make sure I'm not just like rocking back and forth, right? Those things that we naturally do to kind of like regulate ourselves um, if we're feeling um, kind of upset. And so um, it's important that we do our best to kind of create those, um, those boundaries where we can, the structure um, to stay regulated. Um, you know, if you think about times that you've been really, really stressed, Imagine if you felt that way five hours at a time, 12 hours at a time, 24 seven, right? It doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel good to be, to have your body kind of running on overdrive like that um, nonstop. And so to find ways to, to create some calm and a break um, is so important for our physical and emotional well-being. So we're gonna wanna set some boundaries and routines at home. Where is workspace? Where is play space? Um, do you try to get up at the same time every day? Do you try to have a warm, you know, breakfast or um, have your lunch time? Do you um, maintain your physical activity, going for a walk, doing bike rides, doing the things that you enjoy? Um, how can you create a visual calendar for a kiddo? So even with kids not being in school now, calendars can help them get a sense of their day. You know, I use my calendar at work to know what I'm doing. That's my visual calendar um, to prompt me to know what my day is going to be like. So how can we help create some of that for our kids? Um, and then, you know, set some physical activity breaks for yourself. I mentioned that um, movement is such a key part of physical and emotional regulation. And it's a great thing to do as a family. Um, we recently bought bicycles a couple weeks ago and, and being able to go out and do that together has been um, a really great family, um, family activity to keep ourselves moving and, um, and to get away from being, you know, on the computer all day. Um, next slide, please. Um, so this kind of, this image kind of ties together um, some of the tips that we've been discussing. Um, as you see in the bottom, I borrowed it from another um, behavioral health center. But um, so again, just kind of, it's a nice visual for why routine is important, why emotional connectivity, outdoor activities, um, all that's really key. Um, focusing on what you can control kind of goes back to my point before by not just dismissing, you know, oh, everything will be fine, but here's what we're doing. This is the, you know, the focus that we're taking to, to get through this. Um, and on the right-hand side, keeping kiddos busy. Um, and then also to not get so caught up in like the social media things we see of, you know, the, the perfect parent who's created the perfect elaborate art activity or built their own roller coaster at home for their kids to re-experience amusement parks, right? Like we're all doing the best we can. Um, and so don't let yourself get too wrapped up in um, or the parents that you're working with on what we see on social media because um, it's hard. It's not easy managing all of this. And I think everyone is, um, like I said, really doing the best they can to navigate. Next slide, please. All right, what about you? What about you as adults? The same rules apply, right? We need all of this stuff. Um, we need routine and boundaries and connection and patience for yourself. Um, you know, there's a lot going on at home, right? Like we are stuck at home with people all the time. So you may find with your, your partner or other adults you live with that 
you're nitpicking over things or you're you're arguing over the dishes. I mean, there's just, we are stuck with, um, one of my good friends says something about, you know, we're stuck with the idiosyncrasies of those we love, right? And we're not typically with them all day. Um, and so, and our families are our coworkers, right? Like I joke when my animals are sitting with me, like, oh, here's my coworker for today. I mean, we're just, we're living in different environments. Um, but it's so important to remember that it's really hard to care for kiddos if you're not caring for yourself and you're not doing the things that you need as well. Um, and so again, just kind of going back to what I alluded to before, I mean, many of these tips aren't new, right? You're seeing these things on social media, you're hearing about it on the news, you're seeing infographics like the ones I shared um, about how to create routine, how to um, make your own space at home. But really, again, it's the why. Like, why is this so important? And um, it's really hard for any of us, just to reiterate, it's really hard for any of us to be successful when we're working on overdrive. Um, you know, and thinking about kind of the brain and how, and I'm not a, you know, brain science expert by any means, but I know that kind of this front, frontal lobe of the brain is really where our like impulsive, um, primitive responses happen. So those of us who work in mental health, we call this like the trauma brain up front. So when you're feeling overwhelmed, when you're feeling at risk, when you're feeling um, threatened in some way, we revert to trauma brain, right? Flight, um, flight, fight, uh, flee, and freeze. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to picture those in my head. So there's the kind of typical reactions that we have. And, um, and we do what's kind of our basic instinct to us, and everyone is different. And so our goal is to help people stay in like the executive functioning part of the brain, right? To build those skills, to build that frustration tolerance, um, to build those coping skills so that um, when we are overwhelmed, when things get really hard, we're still having those feelings, but they're not getting so big. We're not overcome by trauma brain or by reactive, more primitive brain, um, but that we really are able to focus on um, making good, good um, decisions and having good communication and all of that. So, as adults, we want to focus on that for ourselves. So especially for younger kiddos, we can help them kind of calm down and regulate um, through physical activity, through through hugs, through um, talking things out so they can move back to that more advanced part of the brain um, that helps them make good decisions. Next slide, please. All right, okay, so I'm just looking at time. So this is actually, um, so this is my second to last slide. So um, really, I just wanted to talk about some available resources. Um, some of these may be new, some of these may be ones you already know about, but I think um, it's an important refresher. So um, the internet, even though social media can be, um, can be a pain sometimes, actually has incredible resources, right? We know that there are social stories available. So social stories are, um, things that help you walk through um, steps or how to understand things for kids that have pictures associated. So here's why we wash our hands. Here's why we wear masks when we go into public. Um, and social stories can help that be really clear to a, to a child. Um, I know that we have loved um, YouTube homeschooling channels. Our kiddo is obsessed with like science videos and trying to make all kinds of interesting things. And so um, it can be a great way to help kids stay connected with math and science. We've been, we found videos on guitar, so she can be working on her guitar um, skills and really um, to find the good resources, right? So kids aren't just like ingesting like fluff and, and stuff that um, won't help build some of those skills. I mean, there's, there's yoga videos and all kinds of cool stuff. Um, there, um, I put a resource on the final slide of kind of 20 top um, apps for kids um, for like calming and and mindfulness, but here's three that I've heard really good things about um, that are free, calm, dreamy kid, and headspace are great things to do, even with little ones. Um, there's really fun yoga that you can do with little ones that you can pretend you're animals and, and they totally love it and helps them regulate. Um, tap into what's available in your community right now. So we're seeing all kinds of online resources from libraries and schools and rec centers and faith-based communities. I mean, they're just doing amazing things to keep people connected um, during this time. Um, and then of course, you know, if, if um, there's a higher level need, you know, Aurora Mental Health Center has a myriad of youth programs and services. 
um, I wanted to highlight our Aurora Youth Options, our AYO program, which is um, a prevention focused middle and high school age program that works throughout schools in Aurora. And so um, I just want to highlight some of the cool things that they've been doing. So um, AYO, one of their big focuses is on mentoring. And so um, during COVID and with people being at home, we actually have more mentors than ever wanting to, to mentor and get connected with youth. And so we've done all this virtual mentor startup. So we do really extensive background checks and interviews. We want it to be a really solid, um, successful match with the mentor and the mentee with the youth. Um, but during COVID, it's just been, um, we've just been so impressed with how this has grown. So um, that team is working diligently to get um, new youth connected with mentors, um, and even from across the state, like the youth can be in Aurora, but if there's somebody who heard about our program in a different town, like we can maintain this virtual connection. Um, and so there's some really great things out there right now. Um, AYO is also doing some middle and teenage, um, middle school and teenage like drop-in groups over the summer virtually um, with different activities and topics. And so um, I think it's important to be aware of if you see youth really struggling with mental health issues, um, that of course we are available for, um, for mental health services for birth all the way up through um, 18 and then of course moving into the adult world. Um, but that we do have like really cool prevention programs. Um, and I'd be happy to if people have specific questions that you could always email me um, separately and I could talk about some of those, those resources more in depth. Okay, next slide please. All right, so um, it's kind of the wrap up slide. Um, you know, every child's different. Um, every adult is different, everyone's different, right? Needs are gonna change. Um, and, and, you know, you may have a kid who's doing re really well and then has a struggle or a kid who's really struggling and then suddenly doing much better. Um, I think again, just that reminder of, you know, staying present with what you need, um, really thinking about some of the slides around um, the grief cycle and, and the focus on how um, kids may not be able to be um, as vocal in what's going on for them. So how can we be attuned to changes in behavior and um, the, some of those you know, behaviors that I, um, I highlighted in that, that really comprehensive chart. Um, and then I have a good friend who always talks about things being a season, right? This is a difficult thing, it's a season. The season will pass. Um, this time, this hard time will pass. And so I find that to be a really comforting way of thinking about, you know, how we are collectively dealing with all of this and kind of moving through it um, and supporting each other. Um, and so um, I have my contact information here. Um, I have my email and my work phone and, um, and just am really passionate about this topic and supporting youth of all ages. So happy to, to answer any questions that folks may have as well as, um, you know, in the future if things come up or if you have more questions about um, our youth programs at Aurora Mental Health. Um, just on the last slide, if you just wanna show it, Rick, um, we'd be happy to share the slide deck um, are some of the um, resources that I referenced. So that top article um, I found really profound in terms of my thinking about this, that this discomfort we're feeling is grief, um, this loss of all of these, this normalcy. So um, that's a great read. Um, that second one is a helpful resource if you're working with a kiddo with intellectual or developmental disabilities. Um, and so things like social stories and how to um, talk in very simplified language about what's happening with COVID. Um, third one is those mindfulness apps I mentioned. And then um, the last three are resources through NCTSN, which is a National Child Traumatic Stress Network. Um, and that is a fantastic, fantastic resource. Um, Regardless if you're working with youth who've experienced trauma, it's just a fantastic resource. All of these are free. They have webinars for free. Um, and so that's just a, um, a great place to go if you're looking for additional resources as well. And they have resources in multiple languages, which is really helpful. Um, so that's all of my content. Um, I really appreciate you all sitting through that with me. So Rick, um, whatever you wanna do to open it up to questions. Yes, of um, course. Thank you so much, Lauren. That was, that was awesome. Um, I'm checking right now for our Zoom chat. It does not look like we currently have any questions in the chat feature. What I am going to do is share uh, another resource real quick on our housekeeping mm -hmm. items for Aurora Mental Health Center. 
Um, I do want everyone to know that have our main phone number line and also understand our support line. Um, I'm also at this time, I'm gonna unmute Dee Dee Poole. She is with um, the Aurora Chamber of Commerce and she may have some, uh, some comments for us. Dee Dee, are you there? I am here, thanks so much, Rick. You're welcome. Thank you so much, Lauren. Another great presentation brought to us by Aurora Mental Health. <laughs> a lot of great insight and topics, and I really appreciate you putting the last slide of resources on there. Um, Rick usually, usually sends this out to me, and we'll get that out to our members and mm -hmm. post it on our Facebook as well so we can get those resources out. I know a, a lot of what we're hearing is, and I even have a friend of mine who has a special needs son, so um, they're their schedule is just off mm -hmm. and it's just becoming so um, hard at this time just to deal with that. So I'm going to pass this information along to them as well. Yeah. Um, one of the things that we're finding, Dee Dee, is um, one of the programs at our center is a dual mental health um, developmental delay program. And we're actually finding that the youth are liking shorter, more frequent check-ins rather than a typical hour session. So if you, you know, in that program, typically clients are seen for one hour a week or every other week, but because of that change in routine um, and because of, I think, more flexibility with, you know, um, staff working from home and different things going on, we have found a lot of you want to do like a half an hour here, half an hour there, and it helps set some structure for their day. Um, and, but you're right. I mean, it's, for especially for youth that really thrive on that routine. Um, right. And this has been a, a huge shift for a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you again. Does anybody else have any other questions or comments before we let Lauren and Rick go? I'm gonna check the chat line here. Um, no, we do not. But I do have a huge thank you to Lauren for representing Aurora. That is from um, my boss and our colleague, Lori Banks. Um, but I just wanna say thank you so much to the Chamber for this partnership. We really valued this opportunity to have these webinars and to bring this forth for the past eight weeks. And, and I think every presenter has been wonderful. And thank you so much, Lauren, for being here on this one. Didi, you've been awesome to work with and I so appreciate that. Well, uh, I would have to ditto that for you. Rick has been the host with the most. Uh, Rick's been with us doing these, what is it, two months? Is it uh, eight yes. Yeah, so we'll have to get together and see. And just so everybody knows, um, uh, we're working on uh, collaborating with Adams County, who is uh, getting some mini grants put out. So if your organization or if you know somebody that has a business, um, it does have to be 25 employees or less. Um, but that information should hopefully come out within the next couple of weeks. Um, but I will be facilitating that program for Adams County. So we're pretty excited about that. Um, oh, yep. Yeah, so we'll get the word on, out on that. They're um, just getting the app and the application process. You know, naturally, everybody would have to verify their business and their ID and their, you know, uh, W-9s or 1099s, whichever ones they have. Um, so it's, it's a little, uh, you know, working in the makings. But... Um, so we're shifting our focus a little bit more, but if anybody on the call would like to see other webinars on other topics, please feel free to reach out to me. I'm right at the Aurora Chamber of Commerce. If you go on our website and just do a search for DD Pool, um, my email is dd.pool at aurorachamber.org. That's D-E-E-D-E-E -E -E dot P as in Papa O-O-L-E at aurorachamber.org. And uh, we'll be more than happy to get um, you know, some more resources and webinars for you. Wonderful. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Rick. Thank you. I see uh, Katie and Callen on the, on the, I'm sorry if I butchered your name. Um, I see you guys on the call. So thank you all for joining us and everybody have a great weekend. Lauren, do you have any other takeaways before we go? No, I just really appreciate the opportunity and thanks to those who tuned in. Thank you. Thank you all all right. so much. Have a wonderful weekend. You Bye. Too. Bye. Bye.